Hey everyone, it's me again. Thanks again for watching this series on item analysis. I hope you're enjoying our fun introduction. Today, we're going to talk about another number that's very important to understanding how your exam is performing, the index of discrimination. So what exactly is the index of discrimination? Well, the index of discrimination goes a step beyond item difficulty. The index of discrimination looks at who answers a question correctly and examines the difference between groups of students. Simply put, the index of discrimination determines how well the question can tell the difference between high and low performers. The number that's calculated, the index of discrimination, will really come in handy when we need to decide whether or not our question is good at telling us who's understanding the topic and who is not, thus discrimination. How do we find the index of discrimination? The index of discrimination begins first by grading the total test score for each student. Once that's complete, we'll sort the students from high total grade to low total grade. Here you see an illustration of my students ranked from high to low. Now let's imagine there are more students in the class, but you get the idea. Next, we group the top 27% and call them high performers. Then we group the bottom 27% and call them low performers. Why 27%? I don't know. Some person significantly smarter than me decided that that was a good number. Now you might not be able to hit 27% exactly, but let's aim for that number if we can. Then, for each question, we calculate the item difficulty for each group using only the students in that group. Remember how to do this from the last video? The number in each group who answered it correctly over the total number in the group. In this example, all of the students in my high group yielded an item difficulty of 0.87, while the low group yielded an item difficulty of 0.46. Finally, you subtract the calculated difficulty of the bottom group from the top group. Voila! You have your index of discrimination. Also, note that you get two more item difficulty numbers, how hard the question was for your best performers and how hard it was for your bottom performers. Now you might be asking, what is a good index of discrimination? Now remember, as we talked about for item difficulty, you'll never pin anyone down into telling you there are definite cutoffs, but since we're new to the item analysis game, let's start off with some general rules of thumb. Your number is going to range from negative one to positive one, but we're really only interested in positive numbers. Anything lower than zero should be rewritten or discarded. Items with negative numbers, like minus 0.13, are said to be negatively discriminating. That means that the lower performers are doing better on the question than the high performers, which is not what we want to see. If you do see something like this happen, you're going to need to take a long, hard look at that question because there's something wrong with it. An index of discrimination that hovers around 0.2 is generally a bottom threshold. Anything between 0 and 0.2 isn't really doing a very good job at telling us the difference between high and low performers. But remember, this is a bottom threshold and doesn't mean a question that has, say, an index of discrimination of 0 0.07 is bad. It just means that everyone is performing similarly on the question. You'll want to take a look at these questions and see what you can do to fix them using the tips we'll talk about in the next video. As we get up to 0.4, 0.5, or 0.6, we're in great discrimination territory. These questions are going to do a great job of differentiating high and low performers. Realistically, you might see a lot of your best questions somewhere in this range. An index of discrimination that equals 1 is said to be perfectly discriminating. And this is a bit of a golden unicorn because, hey, let's be realistic, you're rarely going to have questions that are perfectly discriminating. But how cool would a one-question exam be? All this said, there is no best, because it really depends on the purpose of the question. If you want everyone to master the content, like say for a formative assessment, then you want to see very low indices of discrimination. But if you want to be able to tell the difference between high and low performers, remember a bell curve, then you'll want questions with a high index of discrimination. To be honest, the best exams are going to have some questions of both. You don't want to crush the dreams of the students in the low performing group by giving all high discrimination questions because there's a really good chance that they're going to get many of them wrong. 
On the flip side, we need some discrimination to start to separate the high and low performers so we can see who knows what. The best thing about these numbers is, as you deliver formative and summative assessments over the years, your numbers become stronger, and after enough times through, you'll be able to handpick questions for your exams that are shorter, but also more reliable in assessing whether or not students actually know their stuff. So now let's take a look at some examples. Column one is a question number. Let's assume for columns two and three that we've already taken the top and bottom 27% based on their total quiz score and calculated the difficulty level for each group. The fourth column, the index of discrimination, is found by subtracting the bottom from the top. Going through the results, we can see that question one is negatively discriminating. A greater proportion of the bottom 27% got it right when compared to the top 27%. This question likely needs to be rewritten or thrown out entirely. Now question two isn't bad it's right against that bottom threshold we've set, so we might want to take a quick look at it to see if there's any improvements we can make. But let's just say that this was a mastery level question and I wanted everyone to do well on it. Question three is a great question as it's realistically able to tell top performers from bottom performers. I'm gonna look at the topic of this question, how I wrote the question, and use it to understand what my good students know that my lower ones don't and also try to emulate the style of this question on others to improve all of my items. Question four could be a lousy question, as it's not telling us much between top and bottom performers, but this is okay if it's a mastery level question. But otherwise, we might wanna look at it to see how many more we have just like this one and fix them if we can. Question number five is our golden unicorn, nearly perfectly discriminating, so catch it if you can. Now our final video is going to talk about response distribution as well as some tips for improving the writing of your questions and their distractors.